dear guests of our online discussion. Uh, welcome on behalf of the German Association for East European Studies, DGO, and the German-Israeli Future Forum, DIT, to uh, today's online discussion on uh, Russian-speaking migration to Germany and Israel. My name is Gabriele Freitag. Uh, I'm the managing director of the German Association for East European Studies. And I will immediately introduce uh, our speakers to you. Welcome to Larissa Remenik. She is professor at Bar Ilan University uh, in Ramat Gan. Larissa is a sociologist and she has been. And also. Oh, and? And social, and social anthropologist, okay. And she has done a lot of research on uh, Russian-speaking migration, uh, social, uh, social um, ethnic uh, aspects, cultural aspects, etc. And I also welcome Yanis Panagiotidis. He is scientific director at the Research Center for the History of Transformations at the University of Vienna. Welcome to you as well, Yanis. Yanis is a historian and also a migration researcher. So he has done a lot of research on uh, Russian speaking migration to Germany. What, what makes both of them such a perfect match for tonight is that they have also both done comparative research on migration to Germany and Israel. So thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, our discussion today is a follow-up of a conference that we organized in November 2019 together with the German Council on Foreign Relations and the Centrum Liberale Moderne. And we did this in honor of the late publicist and journalist Silke Tempel. Larissa and Janis both joined our conference and both took part in the conference. And we have, I think, well-justified reasons for this follow-up now. The conference volume that we published after the conference in German has now been also published in an abridged English version, Migration, Identity, Politics, Russia, Israel, and Germany. And furthermore, I'm happy to say that Yanis Panagiotidis has just published a remarkable overview on post-Soviet migration to Germany. For those of you who read German, post-Sovietische Migration, thank you, Yanis, post-Sovietische Migration in Deutschland, eine Einführung. So in our discussion now, we will mainly distinguish between three different groups of migrants, Russian-speaking people who immigrated to Israel as Jews, Russian-speaking people who immigrated to Germany as Jews, and Russian-speaking people who immigrated to Germany as so-called Russian-German late resettlers, we say Spätaussiedler or Russlanddeutsche. And the migration that we will talk about was mainly triggered by the collapse of the Soviet Union, well, exactly 30 years ago. Uh, Ethnic Germans started to migrate to Germany already during the late period of the Soviet Union, during this period of disintegration in the late 1980s. But uh, most of uh, the people, most of the migration took place in the first half of the 1990s. And I think the comparative analysis of these three groups is also so fascinating because it tells us a lot about the different settings in the host communities, in the host countries in Germany and Israel. So over the next 60 minutes, we will talk about the self-image or self-conception of Germany and Israel as countries of immigration, the changing self-image of the immigrants, and also about the effects of this immigration on the host societies. And I will just give you some technical advice. Um, we will start with a panel discussion and then open the floor for the audience, for you. But you can already start writing questions during this first part of our session. And please use the F and A icon that you see uh, at the bottom of your screen. And uh, 
uh, we would like you to, to indicate your name, but if you want to stay anonymous, that's fine as well. And I really ask you to, to ask your questions very, very brief, just in one or two sentences. Otherwise, it will be difficult for us to integrate them into the discussion. So thank you for that. And my colleague, Alessia Siminina, um, she is the technical host today. And if you have any questions, uh, just send her an email on info at pgo-online.org. So, Janis, let us first look at the self-image of Germany and Israel as immigration countries. So, among others, you have looked at the immigration policy, the immigration policy towards Russian-speaking Jews in Israel and Russian Germans in, in Germany. And uh, Israel has always regarded itself as a country of, of immigration. I think this was always very important for the self-identification. But even to this day, Germany has difficulties in defining itself as a country of uh, immigration. So what did this mean for the immigration policy of both states towards Russian-speaking Jews and Russian Germans in the 1980s and 1990s? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, first of all, um, Israel indeed regards itself as a country of immigration, but um, quite specifically as a country of immigration for Jews, as, um, as is evidenced by its uh, law of return that is quite well known, which gives every Jew in the world the right to immigrate to Israel and become a citizen. Um, so it's a country of immigration, but it's not... Um, source country neutral, so to speak. And um, Germany had something quite similar in the sense that um, Germany was not generally open to immigration. Um, and is, as you correctly mentioned, is still hesitant to define itself as a country of immigration, but it had special provisions for people of um, ethnic German origin from Eastern Europe not from um, anywhere in the world. So there's a, a difference to the Israeli conception, but um, like the, the fundamental similarity was this, that both countries provided access um, to their citizenship to people who shared the ethnic origin of the, um, of the state population, so to speak. Um, and this, um, this made this kind of um, migration possible, a, a massive movement of people in a quite short time, we're talking about um, several million people um, who moved within a range of um, of some some ten years, essentially, um, and who were received in both countries um, with um, well, first of all, they received citizenship, which was um, mm -hmm. which was very important, um, and they also received um, integration benefits to some extent, which especially in Germany was not the rule at the time that immigrants would, would get this kind of um, integration aid, language classes, um, you know, and financial, financial subsidies. Um, those were all things that, that um, were basically remnants of the, of the earlier integration policies for expellees after the Second World War, which were then adapted to um, to this, to this particular context. And um, other immigrants didn't get that, for instance. So um, that's what, um, what gave this, um, this, this uh, Russian speaking, and not only Russian speaking, a lot of ethnic German immigrants came from Poland also, um, and from Romania, what gave this migration in the German context a very special dimension. And in the Israeli context, since you compared those? Well, in the Israeli context, um, it was, I mean, the, let's say the, it was, it was, it was diff, it was different in the sense that um, Israel was not a, um, did not receive many other immigrants, let's say. Israel during the 1980s was, was desperately waiting for a demographic boost because, um, you know, a lot of Jews from, from Arabic countries in particular had immigrated during preceding decades and there wasn't, much going on in terms of immigration during the 80s. On the contrary, people were leaving the country and um, 
So when this immigration started from the Soviet Union, actually Israel made a huge effort to get these people to actually move to Israel because a lot of Russian Jews were reluctant to go to Israel. And during the 1970s and 80s, when limited immigration was taking place from the Soviet Union, many chose to go to the United States who also received them. And um, so Israel actually made, made a massive effort to bring people to Israel, um, which, which contrasts a lot with what Germany did because Germany for all its rhetoric of um, being open to ethnic German immigration, um, and they were, but at the same time, they basically told people to stay where they are. Where they, are. they even in, invested in development projects in Kazakhstan and wherever people live to make them stay because Germany was receiving a lot of other immigrants, um, asylum seekers, refugees, and was not keen on receiving many more people, um, even ethnic Germans, um, whereas Israel um, was, really, was really doing the opposite. It was sending people to Russia and to Ukraine and other countries to make them, to make them move to Israel. Mm -hmm. What is so interesting uh, when we compare these two groups is that uh, I think both of you refer to to the migration as co-ethnic migration. So the idea you have ethnic Germans coming to Germany, ethnic Jews coming to, to Israel. And I think, Yanis, you also refer to the term, um, to, to the term of homeland, um, Heimstätte or Heimatland. Um, so is it the same narrative of returning home from the perspective of uh, the country from the perspective of Israel and from the perspective of, of Germany? Well, I would argue that it's, um, and I, well, I argue in my, in my publications that it is quite different in many ways because, is, as I mentioned, Israel has a very unequivocal stance of being the homeland for the Jewish people, um, whereas Germany um, has a much more limited conception in that sense. So um, it always only um, immigrants from, from Eastern Europe. So there was always this connection to, to the Second World War, to the expulsion of Germans after the Second World War. And the idea was that Germany receives people who were not expelled for whatever reason, but who are still suffering under communist oppression, essentially. And uh, so when communism went away, um, for instance, Germany stopped receiving immigrants from uh, ethnic Germans from Poland and Romania because they said now, now there's no oppression anymore. For Russia, it was different. The assumption was that they're still suffering because of their specific history of deportation. Um, and so they continued receiving them, but on very restricted terms. So Germany does not embrace this homeland stance and homeland narrative to, this, to the same degree, no. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Larissa, let us uh, take a closer look at the self-perception of, of Jews who uh, immigrated to, to Israel and to Germany. Um, in Israel, belonging to Judaism is based on a twofold principle. So belonging to a religious uh, community, regardless of your own religiosity and ethno-national affiliation. So what from your point of view, was the self-perception, self-conception of uh, Russian-speaking Jews who immigrated to Israel? Oh, well, it's complicated, <laughs> very complicated, because of course the perception of uh, what it means to be Jewish uh, under the Soviets was very much an ethnic perception. Jews were an ethnic group a nationality within the Soviet family of nationalities. One of them was called Jews um, because basically the religious meaning and content of Jewishness has been uh, all but erased during the 70 years of the Soviet regime, which of course fight at all religions, including Judaism. So uh, people who were born of Jewish parents, one or two, uh, inherited their Jewish ethnicity or nationality, as it was called in, uh, in the Soviet language, which was stated in their passports, in their documents. And so whether they uh, wanted to identify as Jews or not, they had to, because the state always reminded them of uh, their special status. And of course, the street level anti-Semitism that was always there. 
So the um, um, situation with the Aliyah, as we call it, the mm -hmm. immigration to Israel, Israel in, yeah. which is uh, the basic pillar of Zionism, mm -hmm. also the, the main instrument of the nation building in this uh, Jewish state is uh, immigration of Jews from across the world. And of course, it's supposed to be, um, or is framed as homecoming. People who return to their historic homeland. So they were supposed, all those uh, uh, immigrants were supposed to be welcomed and feel uh, uh, at home, to feel solidarity, to feel uh, the welcome of their uh, Israeli brothers and sisters. But of course, in reality, it was much more complex than that. And uh, Israel, which uh, like uh, Yanis has mentioned very much, wanted to receive this huge wave of olim or immigrants. And it was eagerly waiting for it and basically organizing the delivery of the post-Soviet immigration wave to Israel and not to the West. Um, was actually at the loss of how to absorb this huge crowd of newcomers that was streaming into the country by a thousand every day in, in the three years between 90 and 93, about half a million mm -hmm. of immigrants from the Soviet Union came into Israel, a tiny country, which basically increased its Jewish population by 20% over a very short period of time. It was a huge test uh, an overwhelming experience for both the receiving society and the immigrants themselves, of course. Uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so, sorry to, to interrupt, but um, as I already mentioned, I mean, this might, and you just said it, uh, the, the huge bulk of migration took part in the early 1990s. So this is nearly 30 years back now, which means a whole generation. Um, if you have a look at Russian speaking Jews in Israel now, those who still have the command of, of, of Russian, um, to what extent would you say their self conception has changed over this time? It certainly has. Uh, if we are speaking about the generation of the parents, the adults who moved uh, with their families, um, who were socialized by the Soviet system and uh, uh, their self-understanding as Jews was very limited. Uh, it has changed very much. They became much more Jewish, much more Jewish nationalist, you can say. And many of them became, um, became right-wing oriented uh, Israeli Jewish patriots. Uh, and I would say that many of them initially immigrated as regular immigrants because they were mostly driven by the push factors. They were running from the deteriorating political system, economic troubles, unemployment, anti-Semitism to the only country that would have them at, at this period of time because the Western countries start, started closing their doors, as we know, in the early 90s. So they came as uh, regular immigrants. But over time, they became really olim. They became um, um, ideologically motivated, um, nationally motivated Israeli citizens. So the joke is that they came as immigrants and they became olim. I always explain to my students the difference between immigration and aliyah, because aliyah is a very ideologically loaded term. Of course, it, it supposes that you move from a lower place upwards, right? You ascend to Jerusalem, to, to the Jewish uh, national uh, you know, symbols and the Western wall and the faith and all that you were missing in the old country you are getting when you ascend to Israel, to Jerusalem. But in fact, the immigration experience of Olim is not different than any other immigration experience. It's the so, same but, uh, yeah, thank you, Yanis. Um, yeah. If we now have a look at uh, Russian speaking Jews in Germany and also already the, the second generation, so do they also have the self conception of an ascent? So, to what extent would you say their self conception has changed over time? Russian speaking Jews, you mean specifically? In, 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 right? yeah, in yeah. Germany, yes. Yeah. Yeah, in Germany. Well, to compare, huh. to compare yes. this group, yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course. Well, yeah. Well, first of all, perhaps for, for context there, um, Germany was actually 
the other main country that would have Russian Jews, post-Soviet Jews during the 1990s, opening up this um, quota refugee channel in uh, 1990, 1991. And some 220,000 people um, went through this channel. They chose Germany over Israel, which was very much not seen as an ascent. There was a lot of um, ideology um, and, and contestation around this for, I think, obvious reasons. Um, I mean, Israel was not happy about this because they basically argued that, you know, Germany has taken away our, our Jews um, whom we need for our state building. Germany, however, argued, um, or people within Germany argued that you can't really close your doors to Jewish immigrants who want to come to Germany. That would send a terrible uh, message. And um, so Germany let those people in. Um, and it's, their position was very different because they did not immigrate um, into a Jewish majority society. They immigrated into a country where Jews were a tiny minority and where they outnumbered the, the indigenous Jews, so to speak, by a factor of 10. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, um, there, were, there were like Russian, there were Jewish communities with 90% Russian speakers who were supposed, and, and the communities were supposed to integrate those people. So there was this idea that, that the, there was kind of a similar idea in a sense that these people would come to Germany and become Jews or hopefully they were already Jews, but the idea would also be that they become Jews, that they become German Jews and um, revive um, German Jewish cultural life. Um, this hasn't really happened the way people hoped it would, um, but it's, I mean, a lot of interesting things ha have happened. I mean, there was a lot of, um, there was, was a lot of estrangement in the beginning about precisely this ethnic self-conception that Larissa talked about, that, that these people would think of themselves as Jews, but not in a religious sense, that they were not interested in religion at all, that very often they were not even Jews in the halachic sense of having a Jewish mother. Um, so that, that caused a lot of irritation and a lot of people didn't really join the, the communities. They don't go to synagogue, but you know, they are, they are, they are Jews, but they are also quite, there's interesting research on how they are specifically Russian Jews, because they are, they all have family in Israel, they all have family, or many have family in the United States, also in post-Soviet countries, so they remain part of this Russian-speaking um, Jewish universe, if you will, um, and, you know, <laughs> seem comfortable enough, um, the first generation, the, 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 the second generation and the and sort of the younger generation, the younger immigrants, they are a different story. So they, some of them quite consciously um, try and make sort of try and stake a claim to being the new German Jewry, distinct from what went before, but also not just not just people sojourning in Germany for a limited period of time, but they, they stake a claim at being German Jews and at shaping German society. There is a lot of outspoken um, um, writers and, um, and, and journalists, politicians of, Ger of Russian Jewish uh, background in Germany who make an important contribution to the debates about multicultural society, et cetera, um, which is very interesting, I think. And, um, and incidentally, quite different from, um, if I can, if I can say this here, from um, from the Russian, from the from the ethnic German population from the former Soviet Union, who remained politically um, quite marginal in the debates in many ways. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to to briefly discuss this notion of Soviet heritage. Um, when we refer to this group of migrants, we often use the terms uh, Russian-speaking migration or post-Soviet migration as synonyms. Yanis, do you see any difference in the wording if we talk of Russian-speaking migration or uh, post-Soviet migration? Mm -hmm. Well, I do. Um, I do because not because Russian-speaking makes a cultural assumption that these people speak Russian which is not, well, which is 
true very much for the first generation in the sense that everybody who came from the former Soviet Union essentially spoke Russian, was fluent in Russian, in Russian um, perhaps even as the only language. Um, but many of those, especially of those who identified as German in Germany, chose not to continue. They chose to assimilate very consciously, often under a lot of pressure also, but also out of a conviction that this was what they wanted to do, that they were now Germans in Germany and had no interest in being Russian speakers anymore. They, they resent the label Russian speaking even because it implies that they are not proper Germans. And also because actually the, the Russian government under Putin has started using this term of Russian speakers as a political tool also for diasporic claim. So um, whereas post-Soviet, I use this term personally because um, at least I don't make an any, I don't connect it with any assumptions about particular heritage. It's about, um, it is an, a geographic, a political geographic origin from a now inexistent country, which however has shaped the lives of these people. So um, it's, it, it doesn't make any assumptions about culture. Maybe it does make some assumption, assumptions about history, about a shared origin from a political system, which was also some people would say a civilization in itself. And uh, it's a heritage that has shaped people and their, their perceptions, their worldviews. Um, even though I'm hesitant to use terms like homo sovieticus, et cetera, which, which you'll find a lot in the literature. Mm -hmm. I think it's problematic in many ways, but it, it has a kernel of truth that there is of course a common origin from this country that, um, that serves as a point of reference in the positive or in the negative. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Larissa, Janis has just said that um, especially for um, Russian Germans, uh, Russian as a language does not play um, a very decisive role in the self-identification, if I got you right, Janis. Uh, in your studies, Larissa, um, on Jews in Israel, Russian-speaking Jews in Israel, I think you said that the Russian language is one of the greatest common denominators for uh, Russian-speaking Jews. And you, I think you say so, in, it, this goes for Israel and Germany as well, if I got you right. So could you briefly comment on it? W why? Very much so. It actually goes across the board of Russian Jewish immigration everywhere, in America, in Canada, in Germany, in Israel. The um, ex-Soviet Jews um, cherish their cultural and linguistic inheritance and they try to pass it on to their children. The majority of them keep speaking Russian at home and they try to establish all kinds of cultural institutions in Russian wherever they live, including uh, you know, language classes and uh, drama schools for their children in Russian. So there is a lot of effort to, to pass over the cultural heritage to, to the children because very often they think that um, Russian culture is, is kind of superior to any other cultural uh, landscape that they find themselves uh, settled in. There is a sort of uh, haughtiness or the sense of uh, superiority, particularly in Israel where they very often look down at the local culture that they see as Levantine or Asian or um, not developed enough which is a bit funny because many of them, I'm speaking about the older generation, do not know Hebrew well enough in order to judge it, of course. But they've made a decision that everything Russian and originating in, in the Russian Soviet uh, uh, legacies is always superior to anything else that they find in Israel. It was more typical probably for the first 10 years of our uh, acclimation in Israel. It's less so after 30 years, because of course, many, many of the older generation have mastered some Hebrew and they started watching uh, Israeli television and you know, less maybe reading books because the written Hebrew is very complicated for Russian speakers, but many of them have mastered the spoken language and they have to because they need to work to make a living. They need to know some you know, basic level of Hebrew, but still many of them make a great effort to pass the language to the children who very often are not very ardent to pick it up. You know, they don't mm -hmm. see much point in 
keeping the linguistic heritage that uh, many of them do not see much use of. Um, although recently, again, it's a, it's a change of trend because Russian, the knowledge of Russian became favorable as, a, as an additional um, you know, characteristic that can help you to land a job. Mm -hmm. In many jobs, the, the Russian language is uh, valuable and cherished. So some of the younger generation 1.5, as I call them, those who came as children or lessons to Israel, they started getting back to their roots and try to relearn Russian that they've basically lost over the years because now they see economic and social value in, in this additional language. Uh, Yanis, do you see a similar trend among uh, Russian Germans if you have a look at the second generation? As far as I'm aware, only to a limited extent. I mean, you do, I mean, in all the interviews I conducted with, with the second generation, um, Russian language competence was very low, and this is in line with other research that, um, that, that people have conducted. Um, but there is, I mean, there is some effort to, among them to learn. And mind you, those are people who go to university. I spoke a lot mm -hmm. to university students, so whom you would expect perhaps to have a, a certain interest in, um, in languages and uh, even in languages as a, as a particular skill. And yes, all of them said they're kind of interested, um, but I didn't see many sustained efforts to really um, to revive this skill. I mean, certainly not for purposes of identity. This is um, this seems to be quite uncommon among among Russian mm -hmm. Germans. It's different with Russian Jews in Germany. They very much conform to what Larissa said about Israel. But I mean, also Larissa has studied the Russian speaking diaspora on three continents. Mm -hmm. So um, and there are similar patterns there. The, and other research has shown that too. That that language retention among Russian Jews in Germany is higher than among Russian Germans. And so is, I guess, um, um, this, the, the language revival, if you will, among those who've, who've dropped the ball at some point. Mm -hmm. So um, leaving out the question of, of language, is there anything else that you would specify as uh, Soviet heritage that people bring with them or that they still cherish or want to preserve? Oh, God. Is it for both of us? It is for both of you, yeah. <laughs> you go first, Larissa, please. Well, you know, the Soviet heritage is a very mixed bag, of course. It's, it's many traits um, that are both attractive and not so attractive. Um, initially, many immigrants display social dependency, the expectation that the state should, you know, the big brother should provide for them. And uh, all the time, the, they realize that there is no big brother and everyone is standing to themselves and they have to, you know, to rely on their own skills and to advance in the new society, not expecting that anyone is there to help. In Israel, it's been very powerful because over the last uh, 15, 20 years, the welfare state has been shrinking very much. Over the Netanyahu years, you know, ever since the late 90s, uh, the uh, ability to rely on unemployment or disability or in single mother um, allowances has been shrinking very much. So everybody is employed and everybody has to work. It's actually, it's actually the difference between the situation of Russian speaking Jews in Germany and in Israel, because in Germany, as far as I can guess, in the 90s at least, no one could compel them to work in manual jobs if, if they were academically educated. So they were receiving social health and social support. Mm -hmm. And over 50% were chronically unemployed or underemployed. In Israel, you could not allow this because of course nobody would pay you any unemployment over five months. So everyone works in any kind of job they can find. And the e economy and the economic thinking is very much now liberal. Everyone is surviving the way the best they can and they have to develop skills and to learn new occupations if the old occupations do not fit the local market, which happened with two thirds of uh, Russian speaking Jews in Israel. They could not continue working in their old occupations because the labor market is very small. 
and there was no need in Israel for all those engineers and scientists and teachers and musicians and art critics and journalists, and they had to reinvent themselves, okay? And they did. So uh, in Germany, I think many of them were kind of frozen in their old identity because they never had the need to actually join the labor market in the lower tiers of the labor market to make a living, right? So the situation was very different in that respect. Um, but you know, the Soviet, the, the, the so remnants of the Soviet legacies are found in, um, in their take on politics, in their basically on the one hand, uh, being rather inert and apathic and not really participating much in, in political activities on the grassroots level, but also voting for the right-wing parties, which is a kind of a counter Soviet legacy. And again, across the board, the former Soviet uh, citizens, especially the Jews, they vote Republican in the United States and they vote for the right wing in Israel and for the more conservative parties in Germany, as far as I know, because this is kind of a rejection of the red or socialist uh, legacies that they were raised with. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Before I start with the first questions that are already coming in, Yanis, can you confirm what Larissa has just described uh, for the situation in Germany? Um, to some extent, definitely, yes. Um, so, um, the, I mean, this, the, the fact that many people remained unemployed or underemployed and could not, um, could not translate their skills into the new labor market. That's definitely, um, that was a big issue. It is a big issue now again, because all these people draw minimal pension now because they, they never worked in Germany um, and they, they have no claim to any pension, to any pension from, from the former Soviet Union. So they, they, they continue living on, um, on, on social welfare, which, um, which causes a lot of resentment because it's kind of, it, it causes a sense of, you know, having been betrayed to some extent, I guess. Um, so that, that's definitely there. The politics are complicated in the sense that we don't really have numbers on, um, on Russian Jews in Germany on how they vote. Nobody has touched this so far. People have been talking a lot about the supposed and actual right-wing leanings of Russian German immigrants. And those are um, above average. I mean, I can confirm that in my research, um, though not to, the, not to the degree that people thought. So there is actually a solid 40% of post-Soviet origin voters in Germany who vote left-wing parties now, including mm -hmm. actually a majority of them voting for the, for the Linke, for the left-wing party, which is the... Um, successor party to the East German SED. So there, there, there has actually, I think there's some, some nostalgia as we call it in German. So some nostalgia for the East kicking in, I believe to some extent. Um, for Russian Jews, again, people haven't really touched this issue. Um, I think- Oh, well, that's not quite true, Yanis. <laughs> for, for dissertations and a couple of publications of uh, Michael Filipov and a couple of other scholars who compared Soviet uh, origin Jews in Germany and in Israel. And with the political, uh, concerning the political, the, domain, the political, the political, the political domain, orientation. They are conservative. They are quite conservative. Okay. I mean, okay, though maybe I'm not, I'm actually not maybe fully up to date on all the literature there. I mean, I do, what, what I can confirm from my own research is that yes, they are conservative and a lot of them, you know, when you talk, especially when you talk them off the record and in Russian, they will they will tell you what they think about Muslims in particular, which is a big issue. And um, even at events, you know, I participated in Jewish Muslim sort of events of meeting and understanding and everything was nice and well and happy. And off the record, after the event, they, they take you to the side and say, do you speak Russian? Yes. Let me tell you something. And um, then they tell mm -hmm. you what they really think. And there is also a, um, I mean, there is a group of uh, like a section of, of Jews in the AFD, um, which took a few laughs because um, actually but one of the- How many are there? I That's mean. the thing. I mean, there there's not very many in there. They claim they speak for a silent majority, um, which, you know, is a, is a very, very contested claim. And I think in Germany, they are, certain obvious, again, reasons uh, to stay clear of the extreme right. 
but um, it's it's still it is it is I mean it's, there's definitely some some attitudes there which um, which which would be compatible at least within with an anti-Islam agenda for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think to speak for a silent uh, majority is just typical for populists. So, of course. Um, of course. To, to claim as a claim. Let us say here comes the first question uh, for you from Tatiana Astruskaya. Uh, is there any difference? in terms of religiosity, uh, level of integration, change in social status, between the Jewish migrants who came to Israel from the former USSR before and after 1987-1991. So those who came before this great migration and those who came then. Well, are you comparing the wave of the 1970s with the... I years? think 1970s, 80s, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, it's very different, of course, because those who left in the 70s, it was the peak of the communist regime, it was very difficult to leave. And those who managed to get an exit visa, they went through a series, series of tra transit stations in Europe, and they can go anywhere in the world. And as we know, after 73, 74, the majority went, not the majority, but approximately half went to, to North America and not to Israel, despite the fact that they exited on the Israeli, on the assumption that they go to Israel, right? So uh, those who landed in Israel during the 70s, they were usually much more Zionist and much more, you know, or religious to some extent, because the majority of those who came in the early 70s, we're coming from the Caucasus and from uh, Bukharo, from Central Asia, from the Soviet periphery, where Jewish life has survived. Also, Lithuania, the, the Baltic states, where there were some remnants of the Jewish religion and Jewish organizations, Jewish communal life. So they were much more Jewish in their identity and interests and orientation, and they only wanted Israel. They wanted to live in the Jewish state. Otherwise, they, they could go to America, and they didn't. So those who came to Israel in the 70s were mostly rather Zionist and they accommodated and they integrated rather quickly. And of course the country was very hungry to receive them. There were very few immigrants coming in those dates, uh, in those years, so several you know, thousand uh, every year. It was a, a drop in the bucket. So it was very easy to give everyone a, a good integration experience and to teach them Hebrew and to help them look for housing and jobs. Many of them got public housing. So their integration experience was much smoother and faster than the wave of the 90s when it was all very, very different in terms of the mass uh, influx of immigrants over a very short period of time, like I said before. Mm -hmm. So all the systems were overwhelmed. There was not enough housing, no jobs for people who did not know uh, Hebrew. It was difficult to get into a Hebrew class. All the resources were stretched, you know, very thinly in the country. So it was a struggle to integrate over those years. And of course, in the 90s, there was no choice of destination for most. Yanis said that uh, Germany was an alternative destination, but it became gradually more known in closer to the mid 90s. When I was living in 1991, very few people have ever heard about this option. You know, it was a very secret kind of option. No one advertised it anywhere. So it was only passed between people from one year to the next. And uh, so it became a little bit more actual, especially for people in the Ukraine, less so in Russia from the 92, 93, when they started applying to German embassy in Kiev and the alternative uh, line for Germany has opened. But between 89 and 92, 93, Israel was virtually the only destination that was unconditionally open to everyone. And so the stream was diverted into Israel regardless of whether those immigrants were really interested in, in becoming Israelis and uh, whether they were Zionist or not. Okay. So like I said, they came as immigrants. Mm -hmm. So but over time, they realized that actually they are a privileged, a member, members of the privileged majority, of the Jewish majority, entitled for citizenship and all economic and political rights. And they started feeling more and more as homecomers. Mm -hmm. So they became Olim over time, many of them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, with the next question, uh, we'll 
switch, we'll move to the generation who was already born in uh, Germany or Israel. And I think it is a question that is to both of you. So what about the self-perception of recent migration of young Russian speakers that are born already in post-Soviet times? So what is their uh, self-perception? Larissa, um, and I mean, Larissa, you had already briefly talked about it, but... Um, well, of course, there's a lot of difference between uh, generations, parents and children. If we speak about those who came to Israel as children and came of age in Israeli schools and colleges and army units, etc., cetera, um, their identity is quite split. They are quite influenced by their parents and by the, um, the culture and language and books and films that they saw at home. Um, the political culture of their parents, but on the other hand, of course, they are, they have been shaped by, by Hebrew speaking culture and they have Hebrew friends and many of them have married Israelis, Israeli born partners and uh, raised their own families now. So uh, it's a mix of uh, two different proportions of, uh, you know, the ex-Soviet heritage to some extent and mostly Israeli environment and values and lifestyles etc mm -hmm. if you are asking about those who came later on like during the 2000s if this is the question about those who spent all those years in the post-communist russia ukraine and all the other post-soviet countries and then came to israel later on um they're quite different of course because they were raised in a different uh, society um Again, it, in terms of age and uh, cohort and when they were born, like the youngest of them were raised in the country where Vladimir Putin has been the president for 20 years. So they haven't seen anything else and they don't know any other, you know, kind of uh, power regime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we, we even have what, what we call the Putin Aliyah, like that started after 2014 approximately after the annexation of Crimea and the war in Eastern Ukraine, uh, when the political tensions between the liberal intelligentsia and the conservative establishment became more tangible and more problematic. So many people left because they couldn't stand the political climate, not because they were destitute or had economic problems. They were actually living quite well economically but they hated the political atmosphere. So those of them who had a Jewish connection and could use the law of return to come to Israel, use this opportunity to emigrate. Again, Israel was the place that they could enter as Jews by the law of return, not necessarily because they were ardent Zionists or had a very strong Jewish identity. They're mostly members of big city intelligentsia coming mostly from Moscow and St. Petersburg recently. And most of them are highly educated and they, many of them worked in creative occupations and continue working in the same occupations from their homes in Tel Aviv on the remote. Uh, but it's actually a very small group of people. We're speaking about a couple of thousand. It's not that it's, it's, it's not comparable in terms of mm -hmm. size and impact with the mass immigration of the 90s, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's from, from your experience. Well, your research. If, if I understand the question correctly, it was precisely about sort of later immigrants, right, mm -hmm. who were who were born or at least socialized in post-Soviet Russia. Yeah. Um, the funny thing in Germany is that there isn't much in terms of, at least if we're looking at Germans and Jews, um, this hardly exists because um, the German, the German immigration, sort of the German privileged immigration was phased out after 1992. So whoever was born after 1992 does not qualify um, to come to Germany on that ticket. They can try something else. They can also try and drag along their grandparents perhaps who still have a claim if they, if they still live in Russia. Um, but there has been, after 2005, both the German and the Jewish channels, let's say, were virtually dried out. There was hardly any immigration, a few hundred, few thousand each year with a slight increase in recent years. Um, because of, well, in part because, because uh, the German channel got a bit easier again, the language requirements were loosened, 
uh, for Jews, I think the situation in Ukraine in particular has uh, prompted quite a few to leave. Um, but there isn't much going on there. Um, there are, however, other immigrants from the former Soviet Union coming um, to Germany now, um, political refugees um, or exilees, whatever you want to call them. Also, actual refugees from, uh, from the Caucasus, for instance, from Chechnya a mm -hmm. lot. Yeah. Um, so you get that too. And of course, these, these different groups meet. And um, that's actually interesting. And, and I think, re um, I mean, I've only, I can only hint at that in my research to, to what extent these, these communities um, mingle. And they do to some extent. I mean, you have then, for instance, Russian, Russian German women who marry Azerbaijani, recent Azerbaijani immigrants, for instance, cases I came across, or, or Russian Greeks who actually make a triangular migration from Greece um, to Germany. So you get that too. Um, so you have a then then you get a whole new a whole new community of people where where actually I start doubting my own terminology of post-Soviet because they are so post. Soviet that they are perhaps <laughs> not Soviet anymore at all and we're talking about something else but at the same time what they do have in common or like they, they kind of meet on the common ground of the Russian language still I think and um, yeah it's, it's it's interesting what happens then but it's 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 very different I agree with Larissa it's very different from what was happening in the 90s. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think this is a dilemma that all are facing uh, who are doing research on Eastern Europe, that up to now you don't have a proper term that could substitute post-Soviet. <laughs> I think this term still has to be invented, I'm afraid. Can, can, I, I, can, I, Gabriel, can I add something? Oh, yes, sure, sure. The difference between those raised and the post yeah. friends. This is a generation that is much more globally oriented, much more cosmopolitan. They traveled a lot already mm -hmm. on their Soviet destinations. So they, they travel Europe, many got some education in the United States or in European universities, which very much changes their outlook as immigrants. In any country where they land, they're much more seasoned, you know, in terms of their exposure to the West. And they know English much better. Many, many of them maybe learn German at home, you know, so the languages are much easier to them than to their parents. In that respect, there's a huge difference between the generation of children, the post-Soviet generation, and the parents who spend their lives behind their inheritance. Mm -hmm. So exiting to Israel or to Germany was their first major trip abroad, basically. Thank you. Uh, Yanis, there is another question. It is put in German. I will read it out in German and then translate it. Um, can man sagen, dass jüdische Zuwanderer mehr Akzeptanz haben? So, and I suppose, and so it says, uh, the question is, uh, can we say that Jewish uh, immigrants uh, are more accepted? It, the question does not say more accepted than. I suppose it, it refers to the situation in Germany and would mean are Jewish uh, immigrants more accepted than um, Russian-German immigrants or German-Russian immigrants, yeah. Right. Um, well, the, the answer is it depends, um, which is always or never a very satisfactory answer, but it really depends who you ask. I think um, there is more acceptance among, there is more acceptance for Jewish immigrants than for ethnic German immigrants among people who are usually, I would say, pro-immigration and who always saw the ethnic German ticket with a certain, um, you know, with a certain reservation, to put it mildly. I mean, who always criticized the ethnic privilege that these people received compared to others, and who, who, kind of, for the same reason, were not as accepting of the people who came on that ticket. I think that is, that is, there's certainly something to that. Um, on the other hand, um, there was a lot of reservation towards um, those Jewish immigrants too, um, for different reasons. One reason was that people doubted that they were Jews at all. So they said, those are just Russians who just bought their, um, their, their papers on the black market and they're actually Russian, Russian mafia. Um, so there was this, and then there's of course anti-Semitism. So, I mean, that's, uh, mm -hmm. that's, always, that's always there. And the fact that um, 
the fact that we haven't had a major massacre of post-Soviet Jews so far is mainly due to the strength of the synagogue door in Halle. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's, uh, I think there's, there's many, there's, there's many aspects to that. You, 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 I, would, I, would I wouldn't say this you know, as bluntly that they are more accepted. It really depends um, on the context and um, on, the, on, the, on the- Can I add something briefly to that? Yeah. Of course, the uh, Russian Germans and Russian Jews uh, are quite different in terms of their educational levels. So their, their social mobility tracks are quite different. Both the parents and the children of the Jewish origin, they very much put their stakes into higher education. And as far as uh, my studies show, the absolute majority of uh, Russian Jewish kids in Germany completed the abitur in gymnasium and went to, to the universities and got academic education. Uh, and in that sense, they very much succeeded in their socioeconomic mobility. They're much better off than their parents. While in the German case, it's, uh, the legacy is that of quite low rates of higher education uh, due to many you know, historic circumstances. The Germans came with much, much lower levels of higher education. And the question is, maybe Yanis can comment on that, what happens in the, in the, in the second generation? Are the children compensating for that? Second or even third generation that we're yeah. already talking about. I mean, we're coming to an end of our discussion. Yanis, could you briefly comment on that? Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, unfortunately, we're still lacking systematic data on this. Um, my impression is that they are compensating to some extent. So you do see in the in the available statistics, you do you do see some improvements um, in terms of higher education, which I think is due to Generation 1.5 still, who are mainly the ones who've been able to achieve higher degrees in the meantime. Um, in the second generation, it's the jury is still out to some extent. Um, there was. I mean, there was the observation some years back that people of, of Russian German origin who did come with higher degrees um, were not able to retain that level, so to speak, so that their children actually suffered a um, suffered a, um, a an educational descent, if you will, in Germany. Um, whether it works the other way around, the anecdotal evidence would suggest it does to some extent, but um, more research is needed. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, very, very briefly, um, I would, so my, my last question to the two of you is, we have talked about uh, the immigrants so far, about their situation, about adaptation. So let's have a very brief look at the host societies. Um, to what extent, Larissa and Yanis, do you think this uh, huge group of immigrants, Russian-speaking immigrants to Israel and Germany, to what extent have they shaped the host societies? To what extent have they shaped Israeli and German societies? Well, I guess uh, by virtue of proportions, it's very different in Israel because like I said, Russian Jews form about 20% of the Jewish population of the country. So of course their electoral weight is much heavier. And for one thing, their you know, effect on political outcomes and their participation as voters is much more serious in Israel than in Germany. And we have many politicians who are of Russian origin who came with this last wave of migration who are active in national politics. Um, so the impact, I guess, is much stronger on all sides of life, on politics, on economy, on culture, on education, just because we are a critical mass of, of new citizens here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yanis. Yeah, well, the opposite is also true, of course. So the Russian post-Soviet immigrants, Russian-speaking immigrants are not a critical mass in Germany per se. They are, however, the biggest, single biggest um, immigrant contingent. And one could argue that given this, they have perhaps not, have as much, not had as much of an impact, surprisingly, on the face of it. But I think if you look at um, specific localities, for instance, at small towns and villages where most of the Russian Germans actually settled. Almost 80% of Russian Germans live in small towns, which is a higher rate than among the, the average population and much higher than among other immigrants, also among Jewish immigrants who, who prefer the cities because they have Jewish, Jewish communities. 
um, and more oppor job opportunities, arguably. Um, so I think if you look at small towns, um, you find that they had quite a substantial impact because they created new neighborhoods, they created new businesses. Um, they also, or they provided labor force uh, for existing businesses. And uh, in certain areas, for instance, in the Northwest of Germany, where I used to be based, you can actually connect the economic takeoff in those regions over the past 30 years mm -hmm. to this immigration. Um, and I think there's, again, still a lot of research to be done to look at these specific contexts and the specific impact, um, especially in rural areas. Thank you very much. So uh, talking about research to be done, you have already briefly uh, touched upon the issue of a new uh, group of immigrants, the Generation Putin, as uh, we sometimes call them, those who now leave Russia due to um, rising political repression in the country. So it will also be interesting to see uh, to what extent more people will be coming to Israel and Germany due to the political situation in Russia. And this, of course, will be a further field of interest as opposed to the two of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Larissa and Janis, for joining us for this discussion. Um, and uh, thanks also to our cooperation partner, the German-Israeli Future Forum, uh, thanks to my colleague Olesya Simenina for the professional technical support and uh, thanks to the audience. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks for your questions. And uh, if this discussion triggered your interest, once again, do have a look at Osteuropa in the German and English uh, form. And Larissa, I can't count. I can't um, count all your publications, but for those who are really interested in Russian speaking immigration to Israel and also the comparison to Germany, please have a look at uh, Larissa's publications and have a look at Janis' publication, um, Post-Sovietische Migration in Deutschland, eine Einführung. So, a good evening to all of you and thank you.